Okay. Did I just accidentally turn it on? Okay. Hi, Diane. Hey, Diane. There are just three of us here today. Okay, say uh, say something kind of loud, not not shouting, but just hello. Loud. Okay, Let's this up a little bit. One more time. Hello. Okay. <laughs> By default. So, uh, Spencer, are you both in there? I think so. Yeah. Got my glasses on. Capture all three of us. I'm going to sit right here. Okay. Um, okay, so Spencer and I had one question already that we talked through. So I'll, I'll just read, I'll cover that real quick here. Again. Um, Spencer was asking about sections that don't seem to follow the chord map in the exposition. And we talked about how the first section is theme group one. It's going to be in one concrete key. So everything in that section, wherever you decide that section is going to be, everything in that section should cover, should be covered by the chord map for that key. Now when you get to the transition, it's going to weaken that key and set up a, a modulation to a new key, the theme group two key. And you should know what that is from the way sonata forms work. But I'm not going to say exactly what that is. But theme group two should be all in one key. Once it starts, once the transition is over and you get into theme group two, everything else in the exposition should follow that second chord map for the key that you modulate to. Okay. The only caveat to that is uh, chromatic chords might look like they come from another key, like a secondary dominant, for instance. That could, it'd be just two chords in another key. We don't call that a modulation, we just call that a tonicization. Okay, I had a question about the secondary dominance. Okay. Two of them. So, uh, when you do a secondary dominant, and if it's a key change, do you do five of one? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Yeah. You mean when you do the bracket? Yeah. So it's a secondary dominant in the first key, but when you change to the new key, it's just the dominant? If it's if the secondary dominant is being used to switch keys, do you yes. call the, the five, do you call it five of one? Just five. Five of just five. So five all fives are five of one. Okay. So it wouldn't be a secondary all dominant then. Because it's a, it's switching to a new dom a new tonic, so let me let me put this on the board. I think it'll be clear. Our low tech multi. I think it'll still cover it. So if we're going along, let's say we're going along in the key of C, we have one, five, one, five, seven, and four. I, I'm just picking a random example. But I'm in the key of C and I find a C7 chord, five, seven, and four. Um, if that is gonna be the chord that changes me to a new key, then in the new key, it's just going to be 5, 7, and then you would have 1. This would be an F chord. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So in this key, it's a secondary dominant. In the new key, it's just the dominant. And you might, I mean, just for the sake of remembering, the bottom, if you could always write... Of, of, an of one on any chord. Yeah. Okay. It's like putting point zero on a on a number. <laughs> like, like four point zero is still four. That makes a lot of sense. Again with the uh, with the dominance. Hold on. With that being said, I don't know if this question is. Spencer, if you've got a question, you can ask it while I find this. No, it's all right. Okay. I need to generate more questions. <laughs> With 
can pause for a while if you guys want to work on stuff too. Actually, let's do that. We'll pause until we have another question. Why? Well, I, I have a couple. I can ask another one. I'm just saying, people watching the video don't need to watch us sit here and stare at each other. So it's no problem. We can pause it and then come back. Oh, okay. Um, your choice. Do you want to ask another question now, or you want to pause? Sure. I have two others that don't need any. Um, okay. What are all the types of suspensions? Um, suspensions. You you name them by the distance over the base of the suspension, and then the distance over the base of the resolution. That's right. I remember we talked about that last class, maybe, mm -hmm. didn't we? A little bit. So is it... So whatever the numbers are, the suspensions are just named by the numbers of what's above them. So you have the base, not the root of the chord, but the base, mm -hmm. whatever note is the lowest you hear. You count up to the note that's suspended. So remember your suspension is a preparation, which is in the chord, the previous chord. Then the chord changes and that same note stays there. Right. That's the point. You go from the bass up to that suspended note of non-chord tone. Then you go from the bass up to the note it settles down to. If the if the bass note changes under that, do you go from the changed bass note or the original that was on the first one? You go from the bass note that you're using to identify that chord. So if it's a C6, E is on the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. If that E changes to a neighbor tone or something like that, I wouldn't mess with that. You would still name it above the E. So let's say you have an E in the bass and you have a, a D in the soprano. Mm -hmm. And then the, the D is an encore tone and it comes down to a C, which is in the C chord. Okay. With me there. Yeah. Okay, so the D, E to D is a 7. E to C is a 6, so you would call it a 7-6 suspension. Okay. But the note in the bass is a chord tone. It, it can't be a non-chord tone. And how, how do you write that out? Um, what does that look like when you write it? I would just write like 7-6 sus above it if I'm identifying it in my notes. Does that make sense? You're not, you're not doing two? Yeah. Two what? You're not doing two something dash somethings? You're just doing one? Oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. So it's the, the distance between the bass and the suspended note. It's the first number. And then, then the you do the dash and the bass and the res resolution. And the resolution. Yeah. I got it. And let's see if I can find an example. But I mean, it, it literally looks like seven dash six sus. I don't usually mark them, to be honest, so I don't know, it's a, it might take me a while to find one, but it's pretty clear what they look when I write them out. Okay. And I, I, like I said, I don't usually mark non-chord tones because once you know what the chord is, everything that's not in the chord is a non-chord tone. So it's kind of obvious what they are once you know what the chord is. Um, at this stage, I'm not usually marking non-chord tones. I just kind of recognize what they are. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to make you name them for, just for the test. So okay. I'm sure you know them. And then uh, I think the last question I have is you didn't throw any trick questions in here, like when you say, what is the key of the box number X? Those are not trick questions. Those are just questions like, so you don't take, you take my example on the board where we did the secondary dominant and the modulation. I ask you, if I were to ask you about that chord, I would say, what key are you in and what Roman numeral would you put on it? It's possible that you modulated a few chords before I did. Right, so I'm not, I'm, what I'm saying is... Let me, let me finish my thought and I'll get your question. If you modulated sooner than I did, then you would already be in the key of F up there and you would call it 5-7. But if you modulated a little bit later than I did, you're still in the key of C, where you call it 5-7. So all I'm trying to do is make sure that you say, I'm in the key of C and this is 5, 7, and 4. Or, I'm in the key of F and this is 5, 7. I'm trying to make sure those match. Okay. So if you modulate at a different point than I did, I can still see that you knew the right chord in the key that you thought it was. Okay. okay. So what I'm saying is like, you didn't, 
there, there, there is or was a modulation. Like you're not going to say what key is this in and it was in the same key as before. I literally ask you that, that question of what key are you in for every time I ask you to give me a Roman numeral because I want to know what, what key you think you're in so I can give you partial credit if you're in the wrong key but you got the chord right. Okay. So that's not a trick question. It's actually, it's a kind of a, a safety device for you. Yeah. Okay. If you're accidentally in the wrong key, I can give you partial credit because you got the chord right in the key you thought it was. Gotcha. It's not a trick question. There are no trick questions. I, I didn't get to a point where I was like, Unless there's an extra credit, if there's extra credit, all bets are off. I, any, I can ask anything I want for those. And they often are trick questions. Is there extra credit? I don't know if there is on this test. I'm just saying, I don't remember this test that well. I wrote it a year ago, two years ago. And but I'm just saying extra credit questions are, trick questions are valid. What would you say, Spencer? Uh, I was just going to be like, no one really remembers what we did a year or two ago. <laughs> it's the COVID. <laughs> Well, the, yeah, this was it's a whole different world now. I actually did come Where's across my the coffee, question. Amelia? Good. Mm -hmm. Where's my coffee? Yeah, right. Sorry. Didn't even know if anybody was eating. Except when you stopped his eating. Hopefully. I don't see his coffee either. Yeah, I know. I should have <laughs> on me. What he keeps you? telling me they're going to have good coffee at the thing. That's yeah. what they keep telling me. <laughs> What's your question, Spencer? So on, this is very specific, on measure 45 on page 2. Um, this sounds like a question I'm not going to be able to answer, but I'm gonna, I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> and said it's measure okay number 45? Did. Yeah. Uh, in box 7 on D. So course it's asking us to like say what Roman numeral it is, but I'm not really sure what to do because I don't really see a third in that mm -hmm. key and I always thought that we if we were just to have two notes of a scale it's gotta be the root and the third. But this appears to be either like the root or the fifth or something else. This is fourteen. Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure what you mean fourteen. Box 14, is that what you said? This is box seven, oh, seven, part D, as in donut. Um, point number four, you're talking about? Right here. Okay, just making sure we're in the same spot. Is it um, a bitty bitty one? No. It is a pretty you know small box. 7D, yeah. If you look, I think you're misidentifying the notes in that chord. I could be. I'm pretty sure you are. So uh, look at the notes of the chord again. I think you'll be fine. Yep, I sure was. Okay. Good. Okay, so I have a question. On these little boxes, these tiny little boxes on seven, okay. do we have to identify the chord in isolation just based on that box? Yes. So we can't assume things, unless they're carrying over, we can't assume they're carrying over. I wouldn't do it unless you had a really good reason. I don't remember that being a part of any of these, and as I'm looking through, I don't mm -hmm. see it. <laughs> What's in the box should be enough to tell you the Roman numeral. Okay. I'm going to go with it then. Why don't you ask me specifically where you're talking about? I don't remember. I just wrote a big note to myself okay. that says, do we have to look at each box in isolation? But yes, you do. And the answer is yes, so. Correct. I think I finally worked up something, but I have the same issue. I'm like, I'm not seeing enough notes to make that. I did put something here, so I'll look at them. So, yes. I will say sometimes if you have an unusual interval in your chord, it can give you some hints as to what the chord has to be. Okay. That's all, all I'm right, going to say about that. Let me go look at that then. Hold on here. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about it, so. I keep, I, have the, I keep transferring every, by the time I look at this and transfer it to this and then over to this, and then it's like, ah! Are you still good to meet tomorrow? I'm going to work on this some more tonight. I am. Um, yeah. Um, let me know. What Do we have a time set already? Three. Yeah, that's right. At, at four o'clock. Yeah. No problem. 
Yeah, it was C, seven C that was uh, that gave me the problem. B, B flat, C sharp. And that's the one that I was giving you a hint for. I forgot. When I said look at the intervals between the notes and then that could tell you what the chord is. Okay. But that's all I'm gonna say about it. with this so I could like just read the notes quicker and not be as confused that's only your responsibility if no one told you at the beginning of the semester that you should be doing that which you did so uh, I'm not trying to be snarky I'm just saying like six months from now don't be in that same position like you read to get more comfortable with reading notes yeah treble and bass clef you should instantly know when you look at it by now what they are. If you're not there, you know, you are where you are, but don't be there six months from now. <coughs> it takes just a little bit of daily work and you can be past that. And then for the rest of your life, you're going to be a good reader. Okay. More? I think you can bring the question. You, did you get your question? Do you have any more questions? I don't have any more of the, no. Because we're recording this for someone who can't be here, or Diane can't be here today. Oh, I, I actually, I'm sorry. I Do you mind sitting question. over here? I had one more question. Okay. Okay. Um, so, did minor five seven chords at all? I mean, like, is that not minor five seven? Well. Minor five seven would be a weird choice. You that's can't right. you right. can't have a minor five chord as long as it doesn't go to one. And there are just a few exceptions or ways that you can have a five chord that doesn't go to one. So I'll, without looking at the example you're talking about, that could be if you're getting ready to modulate. So if you're going to modulate right on that five chord then you're not going to resolve the five chord to one, right? That's going to be your modulation point. When you get to the next chord, you're going to be in the new key, so it won't be five to one in the old key. So you can come up to this chord. I'm going to modulate on this chord. I've got minor chords, minor key. I'm in a minor key. I get to my five chord, and I make it a minor five. And then all of a sudden, that becomes the new one. And now it's not a five anymore. It's a one, and then it goes on. And I never had to resolve 5 to 1. If you resolved 5 to 1, it had to be a major 5 or That's dominant 5. That's but if you can find any other way not to go 5 to 1, then you can use a minor 5 and a minor key. Okay. But you've got to be clever and find a way that's not going to go 5 to 1, which almost all 5 chords do. Um, 5 to 6 is one way that it sometimes happens. But it's usually temporary. Usually, like, if a composer puts a minor five chord, they're doing it to make you think something weird's going on, hit your ear with a weird chord. Mm -hmm. And then often they come back a few bars later or something and they resolve that and, and let you know what it really was. Okay. <coughs> All my sixths are not on my chord yet. What can, uh, what can be before or after an augmented? Well, after it's easy. It's always a five chord after it. Your augmented six chords are predominant chords. That's where they function. I don't know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that doesn't fit with my answers. Well, <laughs> okay. it may help you correct a wrong answer. All right, must go to five. The chord before them uh, is trickier to answer. Lots of stuff comes before them, okay. um, but usually it's something where the part writing makes sense. So, uh, like a Neapolitan six chord often has a four chord before it because they have the same bass note. On a four chord, fa is in the bass, okay. and on a Neapolitan six chord, fa is the third of that Neapolitan chord, so it's in the bass. 
So a lot of times the course before it will be kind of a part writing thing where you look at where all the voices are in the course before the one we're talking about, and then the, the voices are moving towards that augmented six chord. The chord in between or right before the augmented six chord is usually something that gets the voices to where they need to be in the augmented six chord. Okay. Um, I don't know how helpful that is, but. No, I get it. I asked this question before, and I believe that you answered it. I just want to make sure. <laughs> Diane, this is for you, because Diane and I had a discussion about this. What constitutes, constitutes a modulation versus a something of something? And I believe you said if it's more than two or three measures, it's a key change. Cool. Or it's a modulation. It's two or three chords. Two or three. Or it's actually two chords. Oh, not measures. The difference is between a tonicization, which is like a secondary dominant. Okay. If it's just one secondary dominant, and then it goes right where it's supposed to be, where it's supposed to be, we would call that a tonicized chord. So if you get five, seven, and four, and it goes to four, okay. we would say we have tonicized the four chord. Okay. But then we go on in the original key. We, we didn't really modulate to that key. We just tonicized it briefly okay. to make it more interesting. All right. Otherwise, it is a modulation. So I could have a modulation in a measure for every two measures for a six measures break. And those would be three modulations. Conceivably, but it would be more likely that that was a sequence, a series of tonicizations in a sequence going to a, a maybe a modulation. A bigger modulation. Of it. Usually, if it's within one bar or two bars, it's not really a modulation. A modulation has to be stuff in the key. So, like you'd have a melody, you'd have a, a cadence, maybe. You're going to have stuff in the key. If oh, you in modulate. order to modulate, I should have a cadence. Yes. Well, that's huge. Okay. And not just a not just a secondary dominant. You can't call that a cadence and a modulation. Modulation should have a cadence. It should have a cadence. It should have a theme, a melody in that key. Like it should be stuff in that key, not just one tonicization. I like that modulation. Okay. Wait, what did I just write? <laughs> modulation should. So if we have a <laughs> tonicization mm -hmm. and it happens during one of the questions you where you say, what key is this box in? Mm -hmm. Are we saying the key is what we tonicize? No, no, the key is what key the music is it in. Gotcha. If there's a tonicization in that, that's like a pretend key. Yeah. That's the tonicization. Gotcha. A pretend key is what I used to call it. Uh, I'm sorry, a tonicization is what I have sometimes called a pretend key. Gotcha. It's just temporary. It's not. There's not stuff in that key. You're not really modulating there. You're just kind of hinting at it for one chord and then going away from it. Okay. I didn't know if you, if you like if it was thought of as like a small key change, not not necessarily a modula modulation, but. You could think of it as a micro key change, but it's so micro that we don't even acknowledge it. Key. Okay. We, I mean, we acknowledge it in the sense that we give it a secondary dominant, mm -hmm. the slash right. function. Yeah. Okay. But we don't call it a key change or a modulation. It's just a tonicization. Okay. So tonicization is kind of a term you can say for the smallest possible unimportant key change you can use. That's a tonicization. Okay. And these, this level of questioning should have been happening all semester long. So for next semester, we need to try and get more questions. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. This is a tough issue. But we need to be more dialogue in our class and less lecture, I think, next semester. So I'm putting that on YouTube especially. I want you to ask more questions next semester. Okay. All semester long. Yeah. Where are all your friends? Yeah, I mean, this is the safest environment I can imagine yeah, for this class. I mean, everybody is supportive. There are no enemies in this class. So we all need to be more vulnerable and more vocal about the things we don't know next semester. Okay. Everybody will benefit from that. So it's strong. We'll try to that next semester. I don't know. <laughs> well, we're going to do something. I make up for all you guys. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think I asked this before, too, but. 
So if I have a modulation, and you want me to tell you what key some chord is in after that modulation, mm -hmm. it's in the modulated key, correct? Not correct. in the original piece. Once you, once you use the brackets and you write a colon, yeah. anywhere you write the key with a colon after it, uh -huh. everything after that exactly. has to be relating to that colon okay. or that key that you named with the colon. Um, Until you change it again. Okay, and here's where I'm really going to seem ignorant. What constitutes a key center? Is that the modulation? A key center is just the name of a key. The modulation. So it's the modulation. When you modulate, you have a new key center. Okay. So if you're, if you have a piece in C and it modulates with the key of G, G is the new key center. It's just another way to say the name of the key. So key centers with, with measure numbers. You want to know where the modulation is. Yeah, that's that asking you where the modulations are, correct. Okay, key centers with measure numbers, so where does it modulate? I mean, technically it's kind of asking for a range of measures that are in that key. So like measure oh. 14 to 20 is in the key of C flat or whatever. Oh. Key, okay. so it's... Hold on, I can't erase. <laughs> you, you could just name where the modulations are. Because of what I just said, when you modulate, you put that colon there, Everything after it is in that key. So if you just tell me where those happen, that's good enough. It's sort of implied that they go on until the next key change, or next modulation. Sorry if that was unclear the way I said it. I haven't gotten that question before. <laughs> I'm writing it on it. Um, <clears throat> okay, chords by root. Please diagram the whole, the entire development section. So you want. You want from the beginning of the development section all the way to 160, measure 166 or whatever it is. I'm not looking at it, but the end of the development. All the way to the andante cantabile. Cantabile, yeah. <coughs> to the end of the movement. Okay. okay. Um, and then how do you want that presented? Do you just, like, do we copy our page? That'd be fine. I, I'll leave it to you how you want to present it, but. You need to convey the information that I asked for in the question somehow. And by quality, you mean like major, minor, major diminished. minor diminished? Root, meaning the name yeah. of the chord, the quality in the inverse. It's basically Roman numerals, but yeah, without just the Roman numerals. numerals well, that's what I'm saying. If I have all my Roman numerals, then I can just give this to you. This would be something you would do in a place where you weren't sure of the Roman numerals before you got to the Roman numeral stage. You would name roots and qualities. Okay. So like in the development section, you don't know what keys are there, so you can't put Roman numerals on right. it. You name roots and qualities. Mm -hmm. You parenthesize all the dominant tonics in that roots and qualities list. And then you start working out from the tonicization, which are the parentheses. You start working out both directions, and you find the way that makes the most sense which ones are real tonicization? I'm sorry, which ones are real modulations and which ones are just I am really having trouble finding my modulation. I, I can see where they're clearly in B flat, I can see where they're clearly in F, and then there's this whole group of fuzzy, and I'm like, it could be anything. <laughs> well, that's the, they're supposed to be a group of fuzzy, right? Yeah, but I don't know when my group of fuzzy stops. <laughs> oh, well, that's. I'll look at that more, I guess. You're, you're back to the exposition now, right? Well, I can address when the fuzziness stops. When the fuzziness stops is when some of the features of that point would be, you're gonna have a clear use of the accidentals that would be in the new key after the modulation, right? So for instance, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if you're looking at a piece in the key of C major, mm -hmm. theme group one is in C major, theme group two is gonna be in G major, you're gonna see when theme group two starts from that point to the end of the exposition, you're gonna find consistent uses of the key signature G major, which means the F sharps are gonna be in there. Virtually all the Fs are gonna be sharps once you're in the key of G. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that you can tell. Once I get out of the key of B flat, all my Fs are gonna be natural. No. Well, we're not talking specifically about this okay. piece, but 
once you get out of your original key, then your your active info should change. It should change, yeah. And and you got to compare the key signature written to the key signature of the key that you've modulated to see what 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 the consistent active info will be. Change by default. Things change. The other thing to look at when you're trying to determine where a theme group two starts is it starts right. You should have a distinctive theme in the new key. So, I mean, a G made, if, if you're in, if the mod, sorry, if the sonata is in the key of C, theme group one's in the key of C, it's going to get destabilized. Theme group two is going to be in the key of G, and it's going to start with a distinct melody in the key of G, a theme, hence the name theme group. It's a group of melodies that are in that key that function as a section of the music. So, you're going to, it's going to be pretty clear where theme group two starts most of the time. Because you get a new theme that's a G major theme, that means it's going to start on G, B, or D. It's going to move with, you can see passing tones, but it's going to be a G major theme. So the melody is the key to deciding what theme we're on? Well, it's a major Because that was my next question. I'm not sure that I understand where yeah, theme no, that was weird, 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 weird. I can't it. figure out where keys, where themes I mean, everything is different, so every measure to me looks like a new thing. Well, I'm not, this is where I was talking about the gray areas of what the kind of learning we're doing now. Uh -huh. Remember the balloon taxonomy thing? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm really good at challenging. That was way up on the top. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just saying, you don't have to have the same answer that I do. Yeah. If you look at it and you find this is convincing me, then you'll tell me and I'll say, well, I understand where you're coming from, but I think you're wrong, and here's why. Or I'll say, yeah, that's a valid answer, and it's just as good as mine. Those are the two options. You know, If you think about it, and you find the place you think it is, then make an argument for it. And if you're wrong, then we'll talk about it. OK, in a piece the size of this Sonata B13, not the B13, would I expect to see like 47 themes? Or would I expect no, to no. see like four themes? You would expect to see approximately two themes in theme group one and approximately two themes in theme group two. Oh, then I don't know the difference between a theme and a theme group. A theme and a key center? Key center is like... That's the modulation, right? Or, I mean, theme group one is in B flat, yeah. right? Okay. So the key center is B flat. Yes. When you go to the theme group two, it's going to be in a different key. And there's going to be a group of melodies that are in that key. Okay, so a theme group is a group of <coughs> themes <laughs> in a given is key. Is a group of yeah, that's right. Is a group of themes in a given key. Yeah. And <coughs> I mean, you how you determine what the themes are or how big they are. When I say two, I'm saying two substantial musical ideas in that key that are developed into a bunch of stuff in that key that you're going to listen to. And a theme is a subgroup of a theme group. Theme groups are made up of themes, yes. I think you're overthinking the term theme group. It's just a group of themes. Themes being like, uh, the same way you would use themes in, uh, in an essay that you wrote. If I have a theme for my paragraph, it's a topic of my paragraph. Well, in music, that, that's a melody. So you'll have a melody with a certain structure supporting it, maybe some rhythms in the bass line and a chord in the middle. But that melody is the part that you would sing. If you said, well, here's how the song went, you would sing the melody. That's a theme. <laughs> your, I don't your lack of confidence is frustrating sometimes. It was frustrating the hell out of me. Just is as frustrating as it is to you. I'm just saying, you don't have to have perfect answers. I know. You're trying to find the best answers you can get, and then we'll talk about it later. Okay. It'll be fun. Okay, page 35. Okay. okay. I don't know if I know more questions. Well, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You don't have to have anything. Okay. I mean, I'm, this is optional, so I'm here to help anyway. I mean, I'm going to stick around to 
here's some other questions. I'm just saying, you, you looked at me and I was like, that's me. I wasn't. I was just looking around. I'm the only three of you. I'm going to be looking at you approximately a third of the time. Because, <laughs> and I'm right in front of you, so maybe yeah. a little more. That's a key yeah, maybe half. Yeah, I do that in Dr. Meyer's class. Every time somebody does something wrong, I like to let you look at me. <laughs> when he says, why do you look angry when he's saying yes to me? I think it is to you. It is. I do think that one is I have is a very you. straight face. I think that one is. I'm going to give you that one. Yeah. When he says, taller, I think that's to me. <laughs> I could get you taller. <laughs> yeah. Taller. I'm still having problems with pretty much the same question on the same section. I mean, I got 7D straightened out, but 7C is something me. C is nasty. Yeah, it's just it B is. flat, and then it's like C sharp, B natural, and then C. Yeah, this is the same question I asked a while ago, and you said uh, two of those tones are more important than the other ones, and the two that are more important have a distinctive interval between the two of them, which pretty much tells you what the chord is if you think it through the proper way. That's about all the hints I could give you about it. I'll give you another hint. It's the C sharp and the B flat. Those are the chord tones. Um, C sharp and the B flat are the chord tones. Oh, I, then I had it right before I changed it for the last thing. That's said. all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not making any more comment. I got it. I've given you more about that one than I really wanted no, to. No, I got it. I, I, that is what I had. I am not being sneaky on any of these questions. It's not my goal. Okay. I'm trying to get an honest assessment of where you all are right now. Yeah. And not trying to trick you. There are no trick questions. Um, there might be some questions that I, I'm, I'm intentionally finding the most interesting things and then asking you about them. Yeah. But that's not, there's no trick to it. That it's, was pretty obvious. I'm just trying to draw your attention to the mm -hmm. weird part. Okay, I have to go back to 17. The key centers, where does it modulate and which measures? Name. I'm not actually looking at the text. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, tell, I'm telling you. It's number 17 says, key centers with measure numbers, chords by reading quality, Roman numerals with indications of how modulations were done. So I think, again, since I have all my, all my chords and my Roman, num Roman numerals, I can change that. But then it says, indications of how modulations were done. So that's my bracket, my pivot point. Yes. Is that what that is? Pivot point. So that's my pivot point. Yeah. So as long as I put that on here, I can just copy this. Because I, that's my pivot point. I mean, what I would recommend doing is what we did for the, we went pretty much into, <coughs> we went into a lot of detail on the A minor one for how we analyzed the development section. And that's, that's the development section question right there. That was the development section, yes. So I mean, I wrote it out. Yes, because there's my A minor one. So that is what I did on the A minor one. If you want to see those steps and like a discussion of it, that 10 o'clock session that I did with Diane, uh -huh. that's what we did for that, that oh. whole piece. Okay. And those documents I gave you, the one that's like six feet wide, yeah. one of those is me doing that for the development section of this piece. There were two of them that are six feet wide. Uh -huh. One is the comparison of the exposition and the recap. And the other one is the development section, exactly what I'm asking you to do there. So you might look at that one and sort of extrapolate from it a little bit. Where is that again? That's it. This is all in the 10 o'clock one? Uh, it is in there, a discussion of it in real time. But also that document is in the current folder, I think. Or the, it's in the A minor, but not a folder in, in Google Drive. But we have to do it that way. I can't just copy what I did and give it. Well, I, as long as you're answering the question, you don't have I mean, to do I it. I think I am. I, I accounted for everything you have here, yeah. except my pivot point because it's right in my pages. But, okay. Then, describe two queens that are discovered during the, uh, okay, that's just, that's interpretive. Mm -hmm. Okay, include a diagram between the exposition and the recapitulation. So, <coughs> um, 
exposition recap. Exposition recap. Yes. This is in lieu of your one that's six feet long because I don't know how to do a six foot. That's fine. Does that make sense? I mean, I literally laid it out on my floor. That I think I have a picture of me doing you do. it on the floor. No, I saw it. I saw it, but I'm trying to put that it works. in something that's more. I mean, it might be helpful logistically. If you, put, if you put a black line here okay. to separate. And I do have the numbers, the measure numbers. Oh, yeah, that's if fine. that helps, That'll but work. I can put a black line. And then, do I have to identify all the cords and everything in there, or is this what you're looking for to say this matches? This is the beginning of the exposition. Mm -hmm. right? Correct. That's okay. It's, I have it. They should line up directly at the beginning. Is what I'm saying. Yes, they should. So other than that, yes, that format looks good. Okay. So, so all of us are going to have to lay it out like that. That's your question. You got to. I got to communicate the answer to the question to me somehow. If you can find a way to do that other than the way that I did it and what I showed you, then I'm okay with that. But you're risking. You know, if what you're trying to do doesn't give me the answer to the question, then I can't give you credit for the question. So I'm, I gave you a system that will get answer that question, um, but you don't have to do it that way exactly if you don't want to. Okay. Do you have another? Um, can I get another copy of this to cut up? I think I did. I so. It's on there. I printed it off. You have it on Blackboard, and I printed it. I don't think I have another copy. I can try to get one more done. Okay, here we are. I missed this measure. I don't have any more printouts with me, but I can go get one. Well, so remind me when we're done. You good. Deep in the theory. Does anyone remember why we met at noon instead of one o'clock? No idea. I thought we were meeting at one. I thought, emails. yeah, there was somebody who couldn't do it. I don't remember who it was. Who couldn't do one. I'm glad you emailed, though, because I would have showed up at this time. And right. it's not any of us, because. I think it might have been Diane. I thought it was Diane or Maddie. Yeah, I was also thinking one of those. I'm kind of surprised Maddie is in there. I'm going to email someone. I think it was Spencer was asking me about the workouts over the break, the musical workouts. Yes. Um, I, I will email you all about that soon. Uh, I just, this week, I haven't had time to keep up with it. But uh, well, I'm going to need a week to catch up with myself. Well, you'll probably get an email from me by the end of the week about that. Um, if you don't, you might remind me. But all right. And this is due Friday at what time? Midnight. Midnight. So, um, and honestly, if you need until Saturday, I can probably let you do it until Saturday night. You think you have time to leave? I have to turn in grades by Monday, so I need time to grade on Sunday, but I could give you until Friday night if you need to leave. Okay. I'll let you know if I need it. Uh, I have to make that available to everybody, so I'll just say right now everybody can turn in Saturday night if you want to. Okay. Now let me turn mine off now. They can't get out of this anymore. <laughs> I have to move on. It's a nice feeling when you submit it and you're just done. And you're done. Yeah, well, my yep. other four are finally all done. This is the last. And uh, with each one, I felt like a, a burden had come off. So, not that this is burdensome, but I mean, I signed up for it. Oh, it's work. It's but not it easy. work. And the rest of my life is suffering for it. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, I. Are we done at one? Or are we still? I'm, I'm not, I don't need to leave, so. All right. I gotta pick up my kid at like 3.30, so. Uh, yeah, I have, be at, I have to be in Edwards at 2.40 for Christ. I mean, I'm not driving all the way back to my house. It's an hour round trip. Oh, uh, where the hell do you live? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not that bad. 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 
other thing is in the recapitulation that are exact. Okay. Based on some other things that you've said in the past. I think that may be more, but I cannot find that. Well, all the stuff that isn't exact, just see if you can line it up to be similar. The stuff that's not exact is in between the exact stuff. If you try to find where it's similar, where it's extra music. Should the exposition have, should there be a recapitulation for the entire exposition? Vaguely, yes. I mean, essentially, he's rewriting the same music, but doing it with but the But adding a few extra rules, a few extras in the recapitulation. The trick is when you exploit, when you compare the exposition to the recap and you set them over the top of uh -huh. each other. Whatever doesn't line up, that's the interesting parts. So you try to see, well, is there a reason that the retransition is two bars shorter than the transition? That's my question. They do not need to be the same bars. I no. can have a gap. If you look at the one that I did for you for the A minor one, mm -hmm. you will see places where I say these are three extra bars. Okay. And the extra bars should come up in the exposition, not in the recap. No, no the recap. extra bars should come up in the recapitalization, not in the You can kind of treat the exposition as the standard, yes. and then the recapitulation is how, how it differs from the standard is what's interesting. It's more likely I will have more measures in the recapitulation. Vastly more likely, yes. Okay, so let me look at the exact one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to like cheat or anything. I'm just no, I know, no, I know. I didn't what's think going on. Question 17 is going on. This is my question 17. 17, I thought, was a development question. You mean 19? Oh, is there 19 of them? I'm sorry, 19. I would go back and watch that video if you're confused about that. I talked a lot about that in the video that I did, that 10 p.m. video with Diane. It should be in, okay. in the Google Teams. Okay. But we went through that piece and we like talked about all that stuff in detail. But I'd recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it. Yet. This okay. This It's an hour long video, but I mean, you can skim through it. I think you can skim through it and find the sections pretty easily. Okay. A lot of it is screen capture of me looking at the score in Big Brother. So when you scroll through it, you should be able to see the score, the, the stat, the score is scrolling through to you. Okay. I think you can. I haven't actually looked at it. So. Yeah, I wish I would remember that ten o'clock on the paper. So bad. But I probably need to get time. Where is my time today? hand technique for probably close to a decade. Never realized that it worked really well on a book on my lap. <laughs> yeah, it's very to satisfying to listen to. <laughs> it's a good way to practice it. Do you finger drum at all? I mean, I have a whole category of things I do which I call finger drumming, but it's not really a term. But it's not, not as far as I'm aware. I mean like, you know, like 8 or 16, 12. Oh, well, a drum machine? Yeah. yeah. I you do? do? Yeah. And I've been trying to apply all this ethnic tambourine stuff from around the world to that. Nice. It's a little, nice. I can do some cool things, but I can't do it like I'm not a pro at it yet. Yeah. I'm working on it. I'm going to be there soon. Uh, it's it's going to be the next big part of my professional development is learning and getting into like big beats kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's, that guy knows the same stuff I do, and he's making music that I can make. Like I'm, that's my role model for my next 
Pretty Who's that guy? He's a guy on YouTube that does. He's a classically trained percussionist, I think, who, which means he also studies folk pop music. Um, and then he does these kind of loop-based pieces mm -hmm. that he composes that are really cool, using vibraphones and drum sets and bass guitar and all that. I don't know what reverb pedal or plugin he uses because he, he, he has like this really spacey reverb on some stuff. I think he's on Ableton, something yeah. in Ableton, but I don't know exactly what. But his music is really good. Yeah. It's uh, really, he's exactly what I've been wanting to do. He's the one that's out there that's doing it um, the most close to what I want to do of anybody. And I think in my training, it's pretty similar to this. So I'm excited to get started doing it. Just got to get my house done in the next few months, I hope. Yeah, this is a Persian finger technique that's, it, it took me years to figure out how to do it and it's still not perfect yet. But on drums, it's just like this hum that comes out of the drum. It's the fastest way you can get your fingers to play that I've found so far. You can, I mean, get the fastest sequence of fingers on the drums. It's just like all eight of your fingers rapid fire at the same time. It's actually time. 10, if you drop them like this, so as you drop them, the thumb hits first, and then you get this cascade of all five days. But you have to use your wrists, and your fingers all have to be, you can't be tense. So you, you're going to hear five sounds each stroke. That's crazy. And then you put them together, and you can make it, it sounds almost like a hum. Wow. Yeah, because if you just do whatever BPM that is. It's like, I guess, quarter notes at 80 BPM. That's like 40. That would be more like 132 or something. Because there. Yeah. Well, if you do four taps at 120 BPM, that's 40 hertz that you've just done there. Yeah. If it's 10. It does start getting to where you can kind of hear a tone out of the hertz. Yeah. A low pitch guy. Yeah. It's interesting. It takes a whole nother level of acoustic dubstep. <laughs> Have you seen any of those videos? Like they'll use saxophones instead of like those electronic uh, keyboards. I know a group, there's a group that comes to town called um, Alarmable Sound. And they do some of that, like they'll transcribe out like, uh, who are the big electric EDM people that they do? Can you name some famous EDM composers? I'm actually really not into EDM, so I don't the really know a whole Apex lot. Twin? Oh, oh, man. There's a whole album of Apex Twin tunes arranged for a live chamber ensemble <laughs> that they did. This whole, this group did the whole album of them. And they're really neat. The drum parts are like three people playing this drum parts. Oh, wow. It's really cool. And it's, and the instrument's like, you have to have a really high level player on all the instruments to do that stuff. Yeah. But it's, it's really cool. With the way it comes out, I like it. Huh. I've seen a few of their pieces perform live, and it's fun. Wow. If you send me an email, I'll send you a link. I think those this stuff's on YouTube. I, I bet you'd enjoy it. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera off so someone's not trying to search for the next question, unless you guys have any more. Do you think you're wrapped up? Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay. I'm kind of stumped still, so I may just...